Hi, this lecture is an introduction to the concept of class group and unit group. It's a part of the Isogeny based Cryptography Summer School of Bristol 2021. Class notes are available in the link in the comment section of this video. So the definition of the class group depends on two main ingredients, namely the invertible fractional ideals of an order of k and the principal fractional and ideals that are invertible in O. Okay? Now, by definition, the class group of the, the, the order O, which need, which need not be the maximum order, by the way, is the fraction, so the quotient of IO by PO, so the invertible fractional ideals by the principal ones. Concretely, what that means is we identify we put two ideals A and B in the same class uh, modulo the principal ideals if and only if one is equal to the other one times a principal ideal. So time the fractional ideals of the form alpha times uh, uh, the ring O. Okay, so in, in a way this is a, we, we sort of like put a lot of things in the same class, everybody differing from principal factor, and then we treat those as one element, okay? Now, one, uh, so one first important feature of the class group is that it is a finite group, okay? So how do we see this? Uh, uh, by Minkowski theory, that tells you that for all uh, principal, uh, sorry, for all fractional ideal B, there exists another fractional ideal B0, actually an integral ideal, uh, B0 of norm, so in the same class, so we denote being in the same class by this equivalent sign because it's an equivalence relation, uh, with the norm of B0 bounded by those invariants uh, of the of the ring uh, in which we're considering in which we're calculating the class group. Okay, so uh, that means that by unique factorization uh, into prime uh, uh, into prime powers of, of ideals, then the class group must be finite because there's only so many b zeros with that property. It also means that the class group is generated by the p's that I mean the classes of the p's that satisfy this inequality on the norm. Now, for algorithmic purposes, this bound here on the, the primes and the norm of the primes that generate the class group is pretty bad because it's of the shape, uh, um, it's a square root delta where delta is the discriminant. So that's essentially exponential in the size of the input. Okay, so anything that we do that requires to even look at those generators would automatically be uh, something that runs in exponential time. Okay, so that's why there are so few uh, uh, un uh, so few unconditional efficient algorithms when it comes to non-trivial computations on the class group. So instead, instead of relying on this unconditional bound on the, the norm of the generators of the class group, we need to do something more. In particular, there are better results that assume uh, the generalized Freeman hypothesis. So uh, it's a result due to back that says, uh, so it's phrased in terms of characters, and we'll see in a second how this pertains to the, the norm of the primes that generate the class group. But it says that if you have a non-principal character, then that, non, uh, that character has to be different, I mean, has to have a non-trivial value for some prime uh, less than 12 bucks square uh, and essentially delta, but also if you're working modular conductor F, then, then this goes in here. But if you're looking at, uh, uh, if you're looking at the, for example, O equals the uh, ring of integers, then you just have a delta here, okay? Now, how does that uh, relate to the, the, the generators of the class group? So let's say you have B, the factor base, that is then generated by the primes P1, P, uh, let's say PK of norm less than 12 log square 
delta square norm of the conductor. Again, in the most general case, if you're looking at working uh, modulo uh, working um, on a uh, non um, um, on an order that is not maximal. And then what happens if this uh, set of primes do not generate the class group? So what it means is you can define a character on the ideals that is trivial on B and therefore on everything that is generated by B, but non-trivial on on the, 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 the all the ideals okay and so it's a non-trivial uh, character that would be trivial on uh, on the um, the set that is on I mean on the all ideals that can be generated by the primes of norm less than square uh, log 12 log square delta but that would violate this statement from back which uh, specifies that it must be that it is non-trivial for some of those primes, at least one of uh, that base that belong in our um, uh, base B. Okay, so what that tells us here is that um, if these primes were to not divide, were to not generate the class group, then we would be able to construct a non-trivial character that is trivial on all those primes of norm less than 12 log square delta square norm of the conductor square. But that is exactly in contradiction of the result of back. Now, like I said, the catch is this result requires to uh, the heuristic that the, a generalization of the Riemann hypothesis be true, okay, which, which is not, so it's, it's conditional on that hypothesis. So anything that has a better runtime than exponential usually relies uh, when it comes to non-trivial calculation and the cost, but we usually rely uh, relies on that heuristic. Okay, so that's pretty frustrating. But uh, usually, we when the most rigorous, um, efficient methods are the ones that quote unquote only assume GIH. Now, unfortunately. Uh, we to uh, we need to talk about the unit group and the regulator uh, when we talk about classical computations. Even though uh, this might not relate directly to isogenies and isogeny-based crypto, anytime we need uh, results in the class group, we usually with the efficient methods that we know, we need to uh, talk about the unit group. So the units are invertible elements of the ring. And in particular, they have this interesting structure where uh, we have a product of the torsion unit, so the roots of unity, um, so a finite group here, and a, non, a torsion free part, so uh, uh, something that is isomorphic to z to the r1 plus r2 minus 1, where r1 is still the number of real embeddings and r2 the pairs of complex embeddings. So the signature of the field tells you the structure of the in group, but not, of course, I mean, it would be too easy. It doesn't tell you who are those generators, okay? So, uh, but we, you know what to expect in terms of the rank. The rank is given to you by the signature of your number field. You get that for free, but you do not get those generators that correspond to those, uh, uh, to those torsion-free uh, components. One uh, very important uh, uh, map is the log map that is a generalization of the usual log where you take uh, each embedding so x sub i is really just the absolute value of uh, sigma i of x and so this vector um, allows us to um, define uh, so take the units and turn this structure into a an additive group Okay, by the log, and that defines a lattice. And the volume of this lattice is called the regulator. Okay, so we here we here we have another uh, uh, volume uh, uh, that comes into play, and it turns out that this regulator value, uh, which is an invariant of our field, is going to play an important role when we calculate class groups.
And the role that it plays is because we know how to anticipate, not exactly, but at least up to an approximation, the value h times r, where h is the cardinality of the class group, and r is this volume that we just defined, okay? So we know how to anticipate, this is, so this is the Dedekind zeta function, and so we know how to anticipate the value uh, through an Euler product. So uh, this will be given by a product of a lot of terms, okay, infinitely many terms, uh, and we know how to find an approximation, okay? Now, under, under the um, a, a generalization of the Riemann hypothesis, we know how to compute efficiently a coarse approximation. Now, this coarse approximation gives us the product h times r up to a factor 2, okay? So, what's really important here uh, is uh, to see where this is going. Uh, this approximation itself was never meant to give us exactly the values h or r, okay? So, um, what we're trying to do here, and it will become more clear when we look at uh, the, the general idea behind classical computation, but it tells us whether or not, when we have a tentative class group and a tentative unit group, okay, this gives us a test to decide whether or not we have achieved the calculation of the unit group and the class group. So usually those have to go hand in hand because the test is a test that tests uh, the cardinality of both groups, basically. So uh, you cannot just have a test on the, the class groups. You cannot just say, I just want the class group and I want my efficient test to tell me whether or not I get the class group. But the test will tell you, okay, you, you, you think you have, you have a subgroup of the union group, you have a subgroup of the class group, do you really have um, uh, both exactly? Well, this test will tell you uh, whether or not you need to work more in your calculation, and we'll see in the subsequent lecture exactly what I'm talking about. But really, this test is crucial, and it's also crucial that it be uh, performed efficiently. Okay, so if the test had been exponential, because uh, while well, the products are very large and maybe they need exponential precision, turns out for such a coarse bound, we do not need to get too many terms. So that is. Uh, something um, that is something very convenient and so we need to keep that in mind for uh, for when we're going to get back to causal computation so thank you for your attention here we've seen just uh, the basics of the definition of a class group and the union group but in the subsequent lecture we'll insist on how we can actually compute those objects thank you for your attention